Next month, the world will celebrate what would have been Nelson Mandela's 100th birthday. The towering figure of the 20th century led the battle against apartheid in South Africa before becoming his country's first black president. He died at the age of 95. Now his legacy lives on in his grandson, Ndaba Mandela, in his new book, Going to the Mountain, Life Lessons from My Grandfather. Ndaba shares the important life lessons that he learned from his grandfather, and he joins us now on the set. More insight from Welcome. this book. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank so, you. I mean, you call him the old man in this yes, book. the old man, granddad. <laughs> but he is a international icon, a national hero, a man that, you know, people around the world revere. When did that sort of enter into your consciousness, that this old man was a little bigger than just the old man? Well, the first time was when we met him. Uh, my parents told me we were going to visit him in jail. So I had a very typical image of what jail was like, you know, concrete barred wardens everywhere, dogs, etc. But when we got there, it was nothing like what I had imagined. It was actually a house, a beautiful house, better than the house I lived in at the time. <laughs> you know, they had a swimming pool. I never had a swimming pool. <laughs> there was a VCR, we watched the Never Ending Story, there was a chef. I mean, I thought it was the most exciting thing uh, <laughs> because I didn't understand he was in isolation, being kept, you know, as a prisoner mm -hmm. during the negotiations. And so, unlike most kids who grew up thinking, when I grow up, I want to be a policeman, a lawyer, a doctor, I told myself, when I grow up, I want to go to jail. <laughs> and you thought that was the height of <laughs> success. How yes. old were you then? I was eight years old. Eight years old. Yeah. Wow. Around eight. Because well, prior to that, he was in prison, like he, a real prison. Yes, yeah. real prison. 18 years in Robben Island. In Robben yeah. Island, yeah. right. So you went to live with Madiba when you were about 11 years old. Your parents were going through some difficult times. What was yes. it like being raised under his roof? Well, of course, it was quite a difficult adjustment because I came from Soweto, which is a ghetto by any standards, moving into a leafy white suburb in northern Johannesburg. Um, security, drivers, you know, cooks, cleaners, etc. So it was like moving into, you know, the fresh, fresh Prince of Brele. You know, <laughs> it was that kind of vibe, you know what I mean? Right, right. Um, and my grandfather was just this tall, very respectful, you know, sort of figure and very disciplinarian, you know? And he would scold me every now and again for, for my room, mm. being untidy. Um, I remember I lost my jersey, my school jersey, for the second time, and it was during winter. So how do you I lose a school jersey? <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, know. how do you like? You know, kids get absent-minded all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so I went to tell him, and uh, he got very angry, and he said, you must go and sleep outside. You know, and uh, I, off I went outside, and it got darker and darker. And just before the sun went down, he actually sent the lady to bring me a blanket. And I thought, wow, I'm really going to sleep outside. And um, eventually, maybe 30 minutes after that, he came outside, and, you know, stood on the front porch, called me in, and he said, Ndaba, if you ever lose another jersey, you will definitely sleep outside. Now go inside, <laughs> eat your dinner, go straight to bed. This is so interesting hearing this other side to this icon. Yeah. I mean, we see him obviously in a totally different light and, and hearing what he's like essentially as a father figure is so illuminating, but actually he sounds just as lovable. Yeah. I feel like yeah. That, yeah. that was a pretty good lesson. You yes. never forgot that lesson, did you? I never lost another jersey, I'll I tell bet. you that. Um, you write in the book that your childhood was really defined by two things, poverty and apartheid. Explain that. Well, of course, um, you know, growing up in Soweto, uh, we were in a, you know, black area, mm -hmm. you know, after the remo forced removals, uh, and that, that's when they created Soweto, actually. Um, and, you know, everything around me was black or white. You know, at home, everything is black, everyone is black, and then you go to school, and then you see the differences, yeah. you know? It's like all the kids got the same shoes you've been wearing the whole year, and the white kids have got the fresh new ones mm. every season, every new term, mm. you know. And um, you start asking yourself questions. And then you go back into the, into the ghetto, into the hood, and you see the police brutality, you know. So a lot of the time I grew up wanting to be a soldier because I wanted to hit back at those who were hitting us, hitting our brothers, my uncles, my cousins, you know. So a lot of the time you grew up with this kind of resentment. You know, I even wrote a story when I was very young to say that one day I want to be rich, but I don't want to be rich like white people, you know? I want to have a big house, but I don't want to have the attitude mm. of white people. Mm. Mm -hmm. You know, I want to have certain things in place, but I don't want to be like them, because to be rich is to be well off, but 
the only people that we knew who were rich were white people. Mm -hmm. You understand? So it was always that sort of, uh, you want to get there, but you don't actually want to be like them. Mm -hmm. You know, right. so that was what defined my, 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 my time. When at you moment. mentioned wanting to hit back, what did your grandfather say about that? Did you ever talk to him about that resentment and that sort of frustration that was building up inside you? I never did, you know, to be honest, because my grandfather never gave me a chance to actually talk about that. He mm. would always preempt me, you know. For example, you know, Afrikaans was the language of the former apartheid government. And my grandfather said, Ndaba, you must learn Afrikaans. You must understand Afrikaans. And he himself read and wrote Afrikaans and spoke it fluently. You know, he would even read the Afrikaans newspaper every day back to back. Mm -hmm. um, and I never understood why he actually uh, wanted me to, to, to learn this language until I read one of his quotations, which read, in order to defeat your enemy, you must work with your enemy because then he becomes your partner. And it's, you know, Anne-Marie mentioned this, how much of a towering figure your grandfather was, not just in South Africa, to the rest of the world. When we looked to the kind of leaders that met something to his people, it was always Nelson Mandela, because a lot of people were nervous, as everybody knows the history of the final days of apartheid when, um, when he became president, and they thought the worst. They thought there was going to be retribution. Yep. And we also forget that, Within South Africa, there were not just deep divisions between black and white. There were deep divisions between the different ethnic communities and the different ethnic groups within South Africa. Yes. The people who were colored and not colored, yeah. the people who were designated one. And he brought all of those people together. Yeah. What a towering achievement to be able to take groups that have for many, many years been on the other side of a discussion and bring them together in the same tent. Yeah, I mean, that was really the, the power of, uh, of Madiba, you know, he, he appealed to the humanity. He appealed to your common humanity. I mean, that's a man, you know, one of his special gifts was compassion. You know, as you can imagine, at our house, we got visited by, you know, George Bush W., presidents, Fidel Castro, uh, Michael Jackson, Evander Holyfield, you name it. Mm. You know, and one thing I noticed about my grandfather is that he treated those special guests the very same way he treated the lady who cooked for us. The very same way as the gentleman who was in charge of cleaning the garden and making sure it was in pristine condition. You know, as the very same way he treated the driver. You know, so that was the thing about Nelson Mandela is that he understood that each and every single one of us, no matter our history, our origin, our story, our demographic, our class, we each have the potential to achieve greatness. It sounds like the person that we imagined him to be, yeah. having not known him as intimately as you, it sounds like he actually was that person. He was yeah. indeed. He was indeed. And uh, I was very lucky and uh, privileged to actually grow up with him mm -hmm. um, during those times. Um, so, yeah. So one last little fun fact before we let you go. Uh, we note that the language that is used in the film Black Panther uh, is Zosa. And, yes. and yes. Uh, right? And, and, and that's kind of interesting yeah, because, is. you know, generally in the past movies, whenever they sought to depict Africa, they sort of make up a language. Um, or if it's in West Africa, they use an East African language. If it's in East Africa, yeah. they use South yeah. African yeah. language. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I don't know how many movies I've seen where people are speaking Zulu and they're completely <laughs> from a different part and of the Rwanda. continent. They're from Rwanda. <laughs> right? Exactly. Um, so that's pretty cool. No, it is amazing. I mean, uh, I was actually blown away myself, you know, because uh, I told my kids to go watch and they start speaking the language and I was like oh wow that's 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 my language <laughs> I understand everything they say you know yesterday it was so cool because I went to speak to a boys and girls club in Brooklyn and I told them that that language is my language they were so shocked they were like oh so how oh, do you great. say hello how do you say bye how yeah. do you say yeah. you know they were so fascinated that I could speak the Wakanda language right that is so <laughs> that's cool so great and it, and it goes to the point that you made about your grandfather which is that he wanted everybody to understand all the languages that you could to yeah. master so that you would have some kind of shared connection and shared humanity with mm -hmm. the people that you're talking to. That's right. Um, it's a fascinating book. It's called Going to the Mountain, Nelson, uh, Life Lessons from My Grandfather, Nelson Mandela. Thank you so much for stopping by. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Yes.